on this edition of Great Lakes Now. Copper mining could mean jobs in northern Minnesota, but is it too big a risk to rivers and lakes? In a water-rich environment, it has a 100% failure rate in terms of protecting the water. And in a story coordinated with the PBS series Age of Nature, can we let some fish swim into rivers to spawn while keeping harmful invaders out? And we want to protect the Great Lakes from Asian carp, but what effect are these invasive fish having where they already are? This program is brought to you by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation, the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation, Lori and Tim Wadhams. The Consumers Energy Foundation is committed to serving Michigan, from preserving our state's natural resources and sustaining our future, to continuing business growth, academic achievement, and community involvement. Learn more at consumersenergy.com foundation. The Richard C. Devereaux Foundation for Energy and Environmental Programs at DPTV. The Polk Family Fund. Eve and Jerry Young. The Americana Foundation. The Brookby Foundation. Founders Brewing Company. And viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ward Detweiler. Welcome back to Great Lakes Now. Northern Minnesota is known for iron mining, but now some want to start mining copper there too. And that idea has caused some controversy. This story was made possible in part by the Fund for Environmental Journalism of the Society of Environmental Journalists. Upstream from Duluth along the St. Louis River lies Minnesota's Masabi Range, the source of iron ore that drove the region's industrial development. Frank Ungaro is the executive director of the industry advocacy group Mining Minnesota. Well, we've had mining in the state of Minnesota for over 130 years. And it's all been iron ore mining, providing the steel mills with the raw materials they need to build this country. But the industry that made the region prosperous took a toll on the St. Louis River, which became an EPA area of concern in 1987. Lorraine Boissonneau is an independent journalist who's reported on the mining industry for Great Lakes now. Any type of mining is extractive, so it has an impact on the environment. And in the case of the iron mines, it's now thought that iron mining is the largest source of mercury in the Lake Superior Basin. Millions of dollars have been spent to clean up the St. Louis River, and progress has been made. But now a new proposed mining operation has raised concerns. Something's coming, Minnesota. Something that'll awaken these sleeping giants and not only put them back to work, but create a whole new generation of miners and the businesses to support them. Polymet's Copper Nickel Mine is coming, Minnesota. Modern, safe, and brimming with opportunity for all of us. Polymet Mining, a Toronto-based company now owned by Swiss mining conglomerate Glencore, began the environmental review process for NorthMet in 2004. NorthMet would produce copper, nickel, and other metals. It would use facilities from a shuttered iron mine, including a tailings basin to hold mine waste, and some feel it's a threat to the environment. It's For more than 20 years, Nancy Schultz has studied the area's waterways and worked to protect them as the water projects coordinator for the Fond du Lac band of Lake Superior Chippewa. This part of the estuary was the Fond du Lac traditional homeland before European contact. This is where there were rice camps and maple sugar bush and fishing camps and hunting grounds. Under the Treaty of 1854, the Lake Superior Chippewa ceded much of what is now northern Minnesota to the U.S. government, but retained the rights to hunt, fish, and harvest wild rice in the ceded territories. That connection through the treaties means that we have an expectation that those resources that were retained under the treaty will be kept healthy and accessible for tribal members to access to harvest. Iron mining in the Masabi Range has already caused environmental damage. The St. Louis River is starting to recover now, but Schult fears copper mining could endanger the gains that have been made. 
the pollution that is unabated from the former taconite mining there. Now we're going to put a more toxic waste material on top of it and not control it well. Throughout the environmental review process, PolyMet has insisted that they have the technology to mine copper without harming the environment. In fact, in March of 2019, PolyMet received the final permit required to move forward with the North Met project. But lawsuits kept the work on hold, and opponents doubt PolyMet's assurances that the environment will be protected. Paula Maccabee is the advocacy director and counsel for Water Legacy, an organization founded to fight sulfide mines like North Met. Across the world, any time that copper mining, sulfide mining, has been done in a water-rich environment like that in Minnesota. It has resulted in toxic pollution. In terms of sulfide mining's efficacy in a water-rich environment, it has a 100% failure rate in terms of protecting the water. Mine opponents also worry about PolyMet's planned tailings basin, a two and a half square mile man-made lake designed to hold industrial wastewater from the mining operation. And it poses two risks. First, it, it poses a risk of seepage, seepage through groundwater that then goes into wetlands and goes into streams and poisons the downstream St. Louis River. The second risk, catastrophic failure, a rare occurrence but not unheard of. In 2014 in British Columbia, a tailings pond collapse sent more than 6 billion gallons, that's 24 million cubic meters of mine waste into two nearby lakes and rivers and catastrophic dam failure can go as much as 300 miles downstream. In other words, far enough even not only to affect the St. Louis River, but even to affect Lake Superior. Despite these concerns, North Met has its supporters. PolyMet is proposing to mine copper, nickel, platinum, palladium, cobalt, and some gold. We use these metals every day in everything we do in our lives. We have an opportunity to mine these metals here with Minnesota's jobs, Minnesota's strict environmental protections, and benefit the state of Minnesota. PolyMet says the new mine operation will directly create 360 jobs and indirectly create hundreds more. In Hoyt Lakes, an iron range town near the proposed facilities, supporters hope the new mine will mean new prosperity. This is then mayor of Hoyt Lakes, Minnesota, Mark Skelton, speaking in 2013. We are pro-mining. We are pro-environment. And we are pro-putting our citizens to work. More than 20 lawsuits were filed over the North Met project, and a number were decided in PolyMet's favor. But in January of 2020, the new mine was dealt a significant blow. The Minnesota Court of Appeals has rejected some of the most important permits for the planned PolyMet copper nickel mine in northeastern Minnesota in a major victory for environmentalists. In its ruling, the Minnesota Court of Appeals called for the state's Department of Natural Resources to conduct a, quote, contested case hearing. Basically, the two sides, PolyMet and the people who are opposing the PolyMet project, would argue about the signs of how much the environment might be at risk from this project. And that would be the first time those arguments would be heard in front of a judge. PolyMet, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, and the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources took the issue to the state Supreme Court, which will now have to decide if the permits were issued properly or if the company and its opponents should provide more research on the potential environmental risks. And so now that multiple permits are under review again, that means there's a chance that the Supreme Court will decide that it might be too risky for the mine to move forward. North Met is only one of the new copper mines proposed for northern Minnesota. To see a documentary produced by Twin Cities Public Television about another proposed mine near the Boundary Waters, and for our own in-depth reporting on both projects, go to greatlakesnow.org. A recent three-part PBS documentary called The Age of Nature looked at environmental restoration projects around the world. 
One of those was about what happened after a dam was removed from a river in the Pacific Northwest and the area was restored to its more natural state. Projects like this have happened throughout the United States. Our next story goes to Traverse City, Michigan, where several dams were taken out and a research project is underway that could change the way fish are managed in rivers around the world. The Boardman is a, it's a unique river in the region, in the state. It's a 260 square mile watershed, drains, glacial outwash, so that we have this very stable, cold, and high water quality system. Brett Fessel is a river ecologist with the Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians. Our relationship with the river, at least historically, has tended to be more of this, what can it do for us? How can we pull energy from it? How can we use it in a way that's gonna benefit us? So everything else just lives with it and relies on it. The Boardman River is a 36 mile waterway in Northwest Michigan with 160 miles of tributaries. The river empties into the Grand Traverse Bay, which is part of Lake Michigan. Today, the river runs freely from where it originates to a dam in downtown Traverse City. But that wasn't always the case. At the turn of the century, four dams were built along the river to provide hydroelectric power for a growing community. The dams changed the nature of the river and prevented native species of fish from moving up the river. By the year 2004, the dams were no longer generating power. Frank Dituri is Traverse City's Director of Public Services. The aging structures were, were considered not econo economically viable any longer. They produced power for a growing city at the time, but they really didn't produce enough power or energy for them to be, uh, for them to be upgraded or viable as power producers moving forward. When funds became available through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, the county and the city, along with other partners including the Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians, agreed to remove three of the dams, Brown Bridge, Boardman, and Sabin, and modify the Union Street Dam in the heart of Traverse City. The effort was part of the Boardman River Ecological Restoration Project. There is no greater ecological bang for your buck than removing a dam. Because what it does to the ecological environmental systems by segmenting a river system, uh, keep, keeping populations uh, apart, uh, warming the water uh, on the backside of the dam, um, stopping the movement of nutrients both directions up and downstream. The goal was to restore the river to its original form and reconnect it to the Grand Traverse Bay and the Great Lakes. The first dam to be removed, the Brown Bridge Dam, came down in 2012. If you look at the bottom of the tree line, that was the level of the water that was in here when Brown Bridge was still operating. In addition to his work with Traverse City, Frank Dituri is also the chairman of the Boardman River Settlement Implementation Team. Once you remove the dam, you have all this organic material, organic soils with a seed bed that's been sitting there for 100 years or so, and then you add sunlight to it, that energy and the organic materials in the sand, it's, it's like this ecological explosion that you're seeing. It's absolutely amazing. Since the dam removal, researchers have seen an increase in the number of native brook trout. We're seeing that uh, the, fish, the fish populations that was typically somewhere 80% brown trout to about 20% brook trout, even out to where it's nearly 50-50 now. And that brook trout exists because it needs cool, clean water at a lower temperature. When you, when you see brook trout in your stream, you know you probably have the best ecological conditions for fish. The capstone of the Boardman River Project is a state-of-the-art research facility that will replace the Union Street Dam called Fish Pass. The goal is to allow native species to move up and down the river while blocking invasive species like sea lamprey. The program is unique because it will use a variety of technologies to determine which fish get to pass. Dan Zielinski is the principal engineer and scientist with the Great Lakes Fishery Commission and is leading the Fish Pass project. We know from experience a lot of these technologies, while they're effective um, in small, small cases, no one technology is, is the silver bullet here. So we're trying to, for the first time, combine everything um, to create a cohesive uh, process that can sort fish. 
first selecting fish by size, so having screens or, or traps that parse out really large fish, and then using uh, successive technologies like putting traps in a certain location in the water column that species like sea lamprey would, are typically found, so near the bottom, using sound or uh, manipulating the hydraulic conditions. So depending on how much turbulence or energy within the water, fish will either be attracted to that or be deterred by that. And then ultimately uh, using technologies like image sorting or image recognition to be able to identify species from, uh, from one another and being able to parse out which one gets passed upstream and which one doesn't. The project is the first of its kind and is expected to serve as a model for other programs across the country and around the world. We've had participation from researchers from the Netherlands, uh, the UK. We presented on this uh, in Australia and had a lot of interest there as well. So there's a lot of uh, global interest in this project because the, the need for selective passage isn't unique to the Boardman River. I mean, this is a problem that's around the world. The new dam facility at Union Street will feature additional amenities for visitors including a pedestrian bridge, rain gardens, kayak and canoe portages, ADA access walkways, and special spaces designed for educational programs. On top of all that, what you get is the scientific outdoor laboratory that people from all over the region, nation, and globe will be coming to. They're already lining up for uh, experiments, starting to submit applications for some of the experiments that will happen at this facility. Groundbreaking on the site is scheduled for fall of 2020, and construction on the new facility is expected to be completed by the end of 2022. Research will begin the following year and will continue for 10 years. Automated fish sorting may be a decade away, but the impact of changes on the Boardman River can be seen and experienced today. This space, this place is probably one of my favorite uh, places to visit. I can remember the time standing here and we would not be able to have this conversation without yelling at each other because of the whine of the turbines and the falling water, you know, this completely industrial environment. And now I could sit here and not say a word and you can hear the wind. Our next segment was produced in partnership with the National Wildlife Federation. The Great Lakes are threatened by invasive carp, but the issue goes beyond our region. The National Wildlife Federation is exploring that in a full length documentary film that you can connect to on our website. Here's a segment from that production. This is Camden Bottoms Wildlife Management Area in Camden, Tennessee iconic southern bass fishing waters. Bill Cooksey of the National Wildlife Federation has been fishing here for decades, but over the last few years, it's gotten a lot more dangerous. I feel like I gotta arm myself for combat. Yeah. Get... There you go, Butler. <laughs> but look at that nasty thing. He's laughing, but the impact of Asian carp on the angler or on the ecosystem is no joke. Asian carp are affecting our nation's waters, fisheries, and freshwater ecosystems, and the fishing, recreation, and tourism economies and lifestyles they support, from Kentucky Lake to the gates of the Great Lakes. Mike Butler is the CEO of the Tennessee Wildlife Federation, which has organized a broad coalition of stakeholders to fight the war on Asian carp in southern waters. It's impacting recreation recreational use, it's impacting lake home values, it's impacting all different types of things, including the health of the fishery. The simple thing that we've been focused on is building a coalition of about seven different states, including their U.S. Senate offices and their U.S. Congressmen's offices, to focus with the federal agencies involved and all the state fisheries agencies involved to go find the resources financially, the money, to give our agencies who are tasked with managing the resource the ability to remove these fish and start to effectively lessen their numbers. Commercial fishing has been used to remove Asian carp on the Illinois River, which is connected to Lake Michigan through the Chicago area waterway system, along with electric barriers. However, a silver carp was found on the wrong side of those barriers in 2017. It doesn't take many to establish a population. Robert Hurstfield is the Water Policy Specialist for the Prairie Rivers Network, which advocates for solutions to clean up Illinois waters and prevent the transfer of invasive species. They are harvesting them, they're pulling them out by the millions of pounds. 
that is fine to address carp where they are. That's, that's an okay solution for that problem, but it's never gonna solve the problem of preventing carp from moving into new territory, including the Great Lakes. If we wanna stop carp from getting in the Great Lakes, we need serious barriers. Something like the Brandon Road Project, which is a suite of technologies that will be installed at the Brandon Road Lock and Dam in Joliet, Illinois. The Brandon Road Project would replace the current lock and dam with an engineered channel fitted with smart technologies like an electric barrier, backed up with a water bubble fence, acoustic deterrence, and a flushing lock to stop Asian carp. Further east, Asian carp are impacting Indiana too, creating a mess of both the fisheries and the banks. Don Cranfill is with Wild Indiana Magazine and is an avid bass angler. He's joined by Dave Hosler, owner of Pilecast Fly Fishing, and the National Wildlife Federation's Drew Youngdike to see how they're affecting the fishing on the Tippecanoe and Wabash rivers. This is typical to most rivers in Indiana right now. These things have devastated the rivers and creeks and they've uh, really, really affected the, the fishing. Uh, what scares me is that uh, these things are gonna take over the rest of the, the reservoirs and uh, then we'll be, all of our recreational boating and fishing is gonna change forever. The Eagle Marsh Berm in Fort Wayne, Indiana, completed in 2016, is all that separates these Asian carp from Lake Erie. Emily Wood is the executive director of the Indiana Wildlife Federation, which was instrumental in assembling the partners needed to make this project happen and stop Asian carp. You know, when they started to do studies in the Great Lakes Mississippi River Inner Basin study, they discovered that this point here in Fort Wayne at Eagle Marsh was the point where uh, it was the, the second most likely spot for Asian carp to make it uh, up to the Great Lakes after the Chicago area waterway system. And so um, this is a huge infrastructure project. Eagle Marsh connects to the St. Mary's River, which drains to Lake Erie, but under flood conditions, it also connects to the Wabash River, which is infested with Asian carp. So without the berm, a flood could put the carp from the Wabash into the Great Lakes watershed. Like not only is it a beautiful restoration, uh, but it's actually serving a purpose of keeping the Wabash River, which is infested with Asian carp, from mixing with the waters of the St. Mary's River, which heads right up to Lake Erie. As a scientist, charter captain, and tournament walleye angler, Ali Shakur has found in his research that if they're allowed to invade, Asian carp could survive and spread throughout the Great Lakes. The rivers along the Great Lakes, there are several that have the correct parameters that allow uh, spawning success. Some of the projects that I've, that I've worked on have shown that um, they could have negative impacts on food webs in places such as Lake Erie, Saginaw Bay, um, Green Bay, um, by uh, outcompeting uh, some of the native planktivores, alewife, gizzard shad, bloaters, for, for example, which would then have uh, in a cascading effect across multiple trophic levels of the food web. Such an invasion of Lake Michigan would impact not just the big lakes, but also the inland lakes and rivers that help make up the Great Lakes' $7 billion fishery. And the damage would extend far beyond fishing. Michigan's $25 billion tourism industry, employing millions in restaurants, shops, and craft breweries and distilleries, and Michigan's $26.6 billion recreation industry, exemplified by small businesses like Sleeping Bear Surf and Kayak, owned by Ellis Scrocky's family would also suffer. We get an influx of tourists from out of state, um, as well as a strong community here in northern Michigan um, that comes up to enjoy the diverse ecosystem that we have in the Great Lakes region, and specifically here in the Sleeping Bear Dunes, um, which was the inspiration behind our shop. And if we had an influx of Asian carp, it would most definitely prohibit that influx of tourists and make it a, a bit unattractive for people to get in the water to paddle and surf and swim and enjoy the, the shark-free waters that we call home. It's not just the economies that are at stake, though. Doug Craven is the Natural Resources Director for the Little Traverse Bay Band of Adawa Indians, which relies on the health of the waters for subsistence, commercial, and recreational fisheries, as well as a deep-rooted cultural connection to the water. The health of the Great Lakes, the health of Lake Michigan, uh, the health of the fishery are very important to the Little Traverse Bay Bands. So one of the big concerns that we have um, is invasive species and their impacts to the Great Lakes. So we're really concerned about the potential for Asian carp uh, getting into the system and adding one more stressor uh, to an already fragile uh, environment. Mark Smith is the policy director for the National Wildlife Federation's Great Lakes Regional Center and serves on the Great Lakes Commission. 
So Asian carp are a national problem that requires a national solution. Our strategy of nationalizing this is working to remove them from existing waters in the south, but also trying to prevent them from getting into the Great Lakes. So we know that our efforts to keep carp out are paramount to keeping our quality of life and our economy here thriving. Not only for us now, but for our future generations. In December of 2019, we told you about Adler Planetarium's Aquarius Project, the hunt for a meteorite that crashed into Lake Michigan in 2017. We're happy to report that after lots of analysis, they found something. One sample that could be from the meteorite and another that appears to be much older. You can find more about that and all our stories at greatlakesnow.org. When you get there, you can follow us on social media or subscribe to our newsletter to get updates about our work. Thanks for watching and see you out on the lakes. This program is brought to you by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation, the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation, Lori and Tim Wadhams. The Consumers Energy Foundation is committed to serving Michigan, from preserving our state's natural resources and sustaining our future, to continuing business growth, academic achievement, and community involvement. Learn more at consumersenergy.com foundation. The Richard C. Devereaux Foundation for Energy and Environmental Programs at DPTV. The Polk Family Fund. Eve and Jerry Young. The Americana Foundation. The Brookby Foundation. Founders Brewing Company. And viewers like you. Thank you.